here we go. Thank you, Nico, for joining. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, he hello and welcome to my talk. Um, so uh, why, why I do this talk is uh, basically I, I wrote an open source library, which I thought only I need. And then uh, now I look at it a few years later and it has uh, 120,000 downloads and uh, per month. So I would like to take you on a journey with me uh, to explore a bit how could that have happened. So, and yeah, this is a library specifically working in Python, working on online calendars. Um, let's see, oh no, I need to do that. Yeah, um, for the structure of the talk, um, whenever you have a question, there are the show notes and you can write your question in the notes. Maybe I can address them while I am talking. Maybe I can do this in the end when uh, we have time for questions and answers. Um, the slides are also online. You can find the link in the show notes so that you can, um, let's see, it's over there for you, um, so that you can click through the slides, go up and down, and click on some links there if you don't want to listen to me and can, yeah, you can basically follow your own rhythm. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll start with talking about uh, the history of the library and then go into the different factors that I see as a, as a success factors for your open source project. And to name that, um, I'm just uh, an open source developer who does hobby projects. I'm not part of any big company or any, any organization. And uh, still, I could do something that people use. And so can you. Yeah, a little bit about myself. I've got a website. Um, okay. But I'm living in the Eco Village TP Valley right now. I live in a yurt with my family together in the United Kingdom in Wales. And um, when I'm coding, that uh, looks like that. I sit in front of my burner, uh, get my knees warmed, and uh, have my smartphone on, on between my knees while I make some porridge and some tea. And yeah, basically I'm offline. Uh, maybe once or twice a week I push my code and listen to some emails from issues and uh, that's basically it um yeah so you can become a, a full uh, developer of libraries and everything you don't need to have a computer or something like this or a stable internet connection though that helps um yeah um now about the the library so um a few years back uh, we were in vandenberg we just uh, created a network of different hacker and maker spaces in this rural area of Germany where nothing much is going on in the digital world. And um, we were faced with this uh, question of how can we tell people when something happens somewhere else so that they can go from one village to another, from one place to another and attend a workshop. So we wanted to have a joint calendar and all these maker spaces, they already had calendars where they put in their, their few events that they made. And they shared them in an open format, the iCalendar format. Um, WordPress at that time provided a solution so that we could uh, join different calendars and put a website up with one calendar. But I wanted to go a bit uh, further and make that easier for everyone, just without hosting and also highly configurable so that uh, other places can show calendars in different ways without needing to set up a WordPress again. And I created the Open Web Calendar project. So you could have static site, find an ICS, a calendar link online somewhere and display your uh, calendar on your page. Um, now that's uh, there already started facing the issue, having uh, the online calendars, the ICS files. Um, how do I display these events? Yeah. And uh, the code for that became increasingly complex so that I decided to carve that little thing out and put it into an own library. And when I look at it now, it has like 120,000 uh, downloads per month. And uh, I don't know even who uses it, but seemingly it's useful for people. And uh, yeah, I want to explore with you uh, how this could have happened. Um, yeah. So I think, um, one of the factors uh, for the usefulness of the library is that I have a use case myself. So when I started, I just uh, had these calendar files. They take one calendar, 
and I get all the events out of it for the time span of two years and put it up on a website. Yeah, so problem solved for me, everything's fine. I carve this little question out uh, and put it into a library of between start and end, which um, events do take place. Yeah, and it has an easy interface, just one function, and I put that out into the world. Also, I added a license to it. I wanted to make it open source, and I choose, chose the LGPL license. That is because I'm, again, just a hobby developer, and um, I do like it if I share my code and I get something back that I can just click Merge. And so I like the cop copyleft aspect of the GPL, that I do not need any contributor license agree agreements. And that also people who use that library, they can be sure if there is a merge request and uh, they use that, uh, that they also have the right to use it and they don't need to make anything else more sure. Yeah. And I didn't use the GPL because I just wanted to try out the LGPL. So that's uh, my reason behind that. Um, and with that, uh, I had a use case, uh, a very like small one, a very rough one, and uh, I had the license to it. It suddenly became a, a common use case, and um, now people are uh, can use it in with two functions. Yeah, so at a date for getting the events of a date, a month, a day maybe, and the between functions still for a time range in which you can receive events. And another important thing is the interoperable base. So when you host your iCalendar, your, your online calendar somewhere, and you download it, you have this file, and the iCalendar module was long, uh, around for a long time already to read these files and use them in Python as an object structure. Yeah? And uh, these, these functions, they basically take this object structure and give back this object structure. So there is nothing new that people need to know. It's, uh, yeah, basically everything is known plus a little function that you need to read up on. So I think this one makes it quite easy for people to actually use um, the library. One of another factor is uh, the documentation first, yeah? So I do like documentation. Uh, a while ago, I read this blog post about write your readme file first, yeah? And uh, I want to stress the point uh, that this is quite something nice because when I write my readme file first, I think about how do I feel comfortable with using my library? What would I like it to be? And uh, on the other hand, if I write the code first and then the readme, then it's more like how oh, all these technical spe specialities, all these technical technical little things, they come creeping through as parameters or as uh, heavy thoughts in my head of how I need to pass that on to the user, but actually I don't have to. Yeah. And with that, um, also it becomes clear uh, for other people what my library should do and what it shouldn't. So when the readme file says, this is what the library should do, uh, people come back and tell you, hey, it doesn't do what it should here. There's the example, yeah? But if I just have a, a sparse readme and no real documentation, then people will be wondering, like, oh, there's a mistake. Is that my mistake? Is that uh, the mistake of the library? Uh, should I maybe write a wrapper around the library so I can fix this use case? Something like that, yeah? But if the readme file just states a bit boldly, yeah, uh, that's what I can do, and it doesn't do it, it actually is a good thing because people come back. And tell you that, and uh, yeah, what I did also with the documentation is uh, just a few answers on Stack Overflow of uh, hey, you could use that library by the way, and uh, you now people start to find it and use it. Yeah. And another factor of of I think what what contributed at least for me to this library is the feedback. Um, before yeah, I had this. Um, this, I, uh, this open web calendar and I had my library in it, yeah, and I would get feedback only from the users of the open web calendar library, which isn't much, yeah. Maybe, oh, this event was displayed a bit falsely, yeah. 
Um, but now this library is used in many, many, many other places. And I get weird, uh, weird calendar files that people think should work. Yeah. And we can like smooth out the edges of this library. And that also improve the main software that I wrote. So actually sharing these little pieces of my code with other people improves my main software. This is one of the learnings that I, that I had in that place. Yeah. And I get a much higher quality in the end. Yeah. And then um, there's the tests that I do like. Um, I call it test second uh, because I do readme first. Yeah. Other people call it test first. Um, and yeah, I do write this library in a test uh, driven way because I like green dots. Uh, um, yeah, no, or it also has other advantages uh, that are not just visual. Um, for example, the knowledge isn't lost over time. So this library is around for a few years now. And I do not want to sit in front of the library and ask myself, uh, this line of code, uh, should I change it? Or maybe should I leave it? Uh, why did I put it in there? Yeah. I know that when the tests are green, I did a good job. Yeah. And, um, and now when the tests are green, uh, it allows me to say, uh, I also did a good refactoring. Yeah. There was a time when, uh, my initial way of dealing with the calendar standard, uh, was not, not enough to, to uh, reflect the complexity of what is going on. So I needed to do a major refactoring of all the code and the test helped me tremendously. Without them, I would have probably broken half of what other people would have expected. Right. So with that, um, with the tests, you get a, a long-term maintainability also. And, and that's probably the, the place where you, where you choose. Yeah. If you have your software project, you may have uh, this really just small one function that's useful for you. That might be useful for other people. If you like cut that out, put it into a library like this one, uh, you may find that the input and the output is quite known. It's like a unit from the unit tests. Yeah. So we have the calendar files. We have the times at which we want to know which events take place. And as a third thing, uh, we do have the events because we can look at another calendar that pro works properly. And with that, the whole function is 100% testable and we can get a really, really high test coverage for our code. So that enables us uh, with, with another, uh, uh, with something else that follows out of that um, cause when we have these tests and people start to create pull requests after a year or two, um, we can actually deal with them fast. Yeah. We can, uh, get the example. We can, uh, write a test and so on. And, uh, when people, uh, want to look around for solutions, yeah, they look at the library and if they see there is no release and no commit within the last five years, um, they'll think like I do at times, um, hmm, um, if I use that library and I run into a problem, I guess nobody will fix my problem and I'll be left alone. Yeah. So they look around for other, other solutions. But if the last commit is from one month ago or maybe half a year ago, um, for quite stable ones, then you would think, yeah, I can use that one. So having these tests in place also allows you to actually, uh, have a faster feedback and more feedback. And, um, I'm really excited about PyTest. Uh, I want to show you why. Yeah. So if you look at the way that uh, we do deal with issues in this, in this library, because it can be tested pretty well, we, we find an issue, we get the example file, we write the tests and then we implement the change. And a test may look really easy, uh, like this three liner. Yeah. Basically it's a function that takes the list of the calendars that we have. In the second line, it gets all the events from the calendar named issue one at a certain date. And then it uh, makes sure in line three that there's only one event. And you may think that this function only runs once. Uh, no, it doesn't. PyTest allows us to run this function several times in several different environments. So for example, we want to test it on the, the calendar that we got issue one. 
but I also test it on the calendar with all the events in a, in a different order so that I make sure that the result does not depend on the order of the events because they can be ordered like they want to be in, these, um, in the standard. And also uh, a third time because Python has its own, its own time zone implementation called PITS or PyTZ. And this is quite uh, old now and shouldn't be used anymore. You should uh, migrate to the newer one, which is called uh, uh, Zone Info, which is available from Python 3.7 and upwards. So uh, PyTest allows us to run all the tests on the old time zone implementation and on the new time zone implementation. And with that, with this parameterization of tests that PyTest makes so easy, we can make sure that the module works on the latest versions and on the on the older versions. Yeah. So that's about the tests. I like green dots too. Yeah, I can multiply the tests with three or four if I want to. So I can get more tests. <laughs> yeah. And one point that I would like to say is um, I'd like to put the complexity last. Um, we have this open specification for the iCalendar format, which is called RFC five five four five, and it includes events and time zones. It includes journal entries, alarms, to-dos, and free busy times, and many, many more features. But if we can hide some of the complexity from people, then they are quite grateful. Yeah, just just looking, just looking at the events. Um, here we have an example. If you open such a file, it begins with an event. Um, then we have a start time in line three. It uh, is in, in a certain time zone, which is UTC at this place. In line four, we say, oh, this event repeats each Monday. Yeah. In line five, we say, um, oh, but the second one doesn't happen, by the way. Um, and in line six, we say, we reschedule the whole thing to the 26th of March. Yeah. And then the event ends. So if we can hide this complexity away and we just say, give us the past calendar here, is uh, the output, the list of events that take place when you want to know it, um, then it's quite a contribution and we already uh, reduce some complexity. We do not need to import much, much more like alarms and so on. And another thing is, I guess, uh, the relationship of the ecosystems. Um, one is, for example, we have the iCalendule as a base that's already quite known and we just plug something on top and basically give the same stuff back. So people are not, uh, they don't need to learn so much. Yeah. Um, and that's easily achieved, I think, with shipping your small functions over to other people. And the second one is the ECAL events library. It does about the same as the recurring events library. It also downloads stuff. And uh, yeah, again, I didn't find that uh, in the right time or I didn't like the documentation of it. That's why uh, I wrote my own stuff. Um, there's the, the third, the ICS Pi library. That's if you just want to give you away your events, but you don't want to read them, you can do that easily with that one. There's the Open Web Calendar, which is again like where this library was created from. One example of an application that sits on top, and uh, the XWR Time Zone library and uh, this was created because major players like Google, they are so big, they say, ah, I don't need to work, uh, work with the standard so much. Um, I, I add this uh, little attribute called XWR time zone into the calendar. And that uh, kind of completely changes um, how the events are being evaluated. And then other people do a lot of guesswork of hmm, what could that have meant or not. And this library follows the same idea as I just showed in my talk, the factors. It has the use case for that library um, to take a non-standard calendar and produce a standard calendar so that we can query the events at certain times. It has an open license that is open source. And we wrote the documentation first. We wrote a lot of tests. The complexity again is hidden or it's like reduced because now people know, ah, I just need to deal with standard calendars. And it's again, a, a carved out little piece that could have been in the uh, recurring e library, but instead 
is another piece here. Yeah? And we already got uh, the feedback like one pull request that went to this library uh, to fix uh, one one yeah one broken evaluation. Yeah, and the ecosystems relationships are the same. Yeah, with this, um, I would like to end my talk. Um, uh, I hope I have uh, inspired you, or if you are if you are writing your own source code, also in your hobby time, you can think about huh, this little function. Maybe I can just ship it off as a different uh, library on on some uh, platform, and then people can use that independently of what I do. You get a lot of engagement. You may get a lot of engagement with it. You may get uh, improvements because it is used in places that you couldn't have thought of. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's basically my motivation. So even if you are just on a smartphone, uh, you can do something that uh, people want to use and want to want to develop with you. So um, thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to hear some questions. I also uh, want to thank for uh, like the presentation engine. So you, this is a website, uh, the First Azure Summit, uh, for being here and the many different ways in which this is made possible. Um, also just developing on the smartphone, yeah? So I leave the, the 